Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us on this first day of fall. My name is Charmaine Ludlow, and on behalf of our new Dean, Dr. Dara Brine, and the entire Macaulay community, I would like to say we are all excited about today's visual presentation. Our At Macaulay series features faculty scholars that are leaders in their field of study, alumni that are entrepreneurs, authors, and leaders in their own community. And today's event will give us insight into all the exciting images we've been seeing on the news, but not really understanding its importance. So who better to give us that insight than an astrophysicist? So I would like to introduce Dr. Emily Weiss. Dr. Weiss is an Associate Professor of Astrophysics at Macaulay Honors College and faculty in the Physics Program at the CUNY Graduate Center and a resident research associate in the Department of Astrophysics at the American Museum of Natural History. Dr. Weiss studies low mass stars, brown dwarfs, sometimes called failed stars, and directly image exoplanets by analyzing their spectra and modeling their atmospheres. Her research group, Brown Dwarfs in New York City, um, has received funding from NASA and the National Science Foundation. And Dr. Rice is a co-author of over 40 referred publications and an introductory astronomy lab manual. So Dr. Rice frequently gives public presentations about space and science, including at the Hayden Planetarium at the American Museum of Natural History. So I would like to introduce and bring on Dr. Rice. Hello, hello from the screening room at Macaulay. I am so excited to talk to everybody about JWST today. Did I share my screen? Are we ready? Um, you might be thinking, doesn't NASA do this all the time? There's been lots of space telescope. It seems like every other day that I hear about a launch or a landing or new data or new observations. Um, but the hype is real on this one. JWST is changing the way that we look at the universe. And so I have um, a lot of stuff to show you today. And my talk I called Exploring the Universe from a Million Miles Beyond Midnight, which is really where the Space Telescope is right now. And I'll explain why we call it that in a couple minutes. Um, and I'm starting with an image of a stamp honoring the Space Telescope that is currently out now. You can actually buy this at the local post office or order it online. Um, and not that it's a competition, but Hubble, the Hubble Space Telescope, didn't get a stamp until about 10 years after it launched. And JWST hasn't even been in space for a year yet. Um, but it's not a competition. All the space telescopes are friendly. Um, I want to acknowledge this before I move on and kind of explain why I call the Space Telescope JWST, and I don't refer to it by its name because there is controversy around the person that the Space Telescope was named after. Um, there's a lot of history behind how, why, when NASA names space telescopes, and a, uh, there's a strong, a lot of a large contingent of the astronomical research community that does think that NASA made a misstep with this one, and that we should rename the space telescope. And so, how, in particular, I want to point you to this um, opinion piece in Scientific American that was written by some of my colleagues for reasons why we should rena rename the telescope after someone other than. Um, James Webb. James Webb was uh, an administrator of NASA during Gemini, um, Mercury, and Apollo missions, the lead up to putting the first people on the moon. Um, but before that, he was also undersecretary um, at the Department of State um, during the Lavender Scare in the 1950s and the 1960s. And so uh, a lot of astronomers think that we can uh, find somebody better to name the telescope after, especially somebody that, um, that's more representative of the scientific community that we want to be and the people that we want to welcome into the scientific community. So I will call this the Space Telescope JWST, which sometimes we um, say stands for the Just Wonderful Space Telescope because it is. And before I get going to talk about the telescope itself, I want to give you the very briefest of overviews of the entire history of astronomical observations, but in 90 seconds and with emojis. <laughs> And luckily, most of it is very simple. For millennia, we have looked at the sky and studied space with only our eyes. And it's actually amazing to, to think about what we did learn about the motions of the stars, the motions of the planets, the seasons, day, night, these things like that that are really so endemic to how we live with just our eyes. We did figure out a lot. 
as human beings. Um, but things really changed about 400 years ago when Galileo first took a telescope and changed it and, and turned it towards the sky. He saw things like spots on the sun. He saw the moons orbiting around Jupiter. He saw craters and valleys on the moon. A lot of things that really changed the way that we understood our place in the universe. But when we were making astronomical observations, even with these initial telescopes, we were still relying on things being intermediated, intermediated through humans to be recorded. So things were still being drawn by hand. Um, and it wasn't until the um, uh, beginning of photography in kind of the late 1800s that we were able to record astronomical observations without human intervention or without a human mediation. Um, and these were done with in, in really the same way that photographs were taken, except instead of on small film, it was done on very large glass photographic plates. And I'll actually show you an example one at the very end of my presentation. Um, a few decades later, we began to be able to use electronics to make digital observations, very similar to um, the techniques that we use in a digital camera. And even before that, things were recorded electronically uh, at radio wavelengths of light, at X-ray wavelengths of light, um, but optically now we can take digital images the same way you take digital images on your camera essentially. And so we can also record and store these data on computers. We can analyze these data on computers um, and the development of astronomical technology has really paralleled and um, ridden along with the development of computer technology. We've also put telescopes in space on rockets and I'll explain why it's important to do that. The first telescopes probably looked down. I say probably because things are still classified. Um, but now we have even more telescopes looking out and looking um, through space and back in time. Hopefully that was about 60, uh, about 90 seconds, nine emojis anyway. Um, and so now I want to tell you why we put these telescopes in space. We don't need every single telescope to be in space, like, sorry, Elon Musk, but no, there, we still can do some great things from the ground. But this diagram shows that um, across the electromagnetic spectrum, so all of the different wavelengths of light, not all of the wavelengths of light actually reach the ground. And so some of them, we need telescopes in space to observe at those particular wavelengths. Gamma rays, X-rays, um, those very short wavelengths of light need to be done with space telescope, ultra ultraviolet radiation, the Earth's atmosphere blocks it, which most of it, which is good for us and our, our, um, the health of our skin. But going into space with a telescope gives us lots of things, lots of advantages. And so we can put telescopes in space, either in orbit around Earth or even further away in order to observe at all of these wavelengths of light. Um, JWST focuses on infrared wavelengths of light, which I'll talk a little bit more about later. Um, but we can also do that for the shorter wavelengths of light too. And there's telescopes like the Chandra X-ray Observatory that observes at those short wavelengths of light. Um, when we have telescopes in space, we, they, these telescopes also produce images that are not distorted by the Earth's atmosphere. And you might not realize this, but looking through the Earth's atmosphere at distant astronomical objects is actually really difficult. It's, it, it distorts the images, it changes the light that we see from these objects. It's actually why stars twinkle. The stars themselves, there is some intrinsic variation in the stars, but we see the twinkling that we see is a result of the light moving through the Earth's atmosphere. It's also kind of similar to looking through the bottom of a, um, looking through a deep swimming pool to something at the bottom, like, is that a candy bar at the bottom? I don't know. It's hard to tell because the water is moving around. It's different temperatures. There's a lot of motions. The, the image jumps around at the bottom of that. The same thing happens looking up through the Earth's atmosphere. And so the, the, one of the reasons why the images from the Hubble Space Telescope, even at visible light, are so clear is because we don't have these distortions from the Earth's atmosphere. Um, important at infrared wavelengths of light is that we can also operate the telescopes at much cooler temperatures, very, very cool temperatures to limit the background radiation, the background that we get um, uh, in the observations that we make from the warmth of the optics or in the instruments or even the earth itself. Um, and so that's one of the reasons why JWST is actually further away from earth, much further away from earth than the Hubble Space Telescope is. Um, and I want to uh, either tell you or maybe remind you that the further away we look at astronomical objects, the further back in time we're actually seeing. So this diagram shows um, some different types of observatories some, or different types of images that we've taken, kind of progressing in time as you go from the top to the bottom. And you can see through the by the arrows that represent that the 
as we advance in our observations, we're able to see further and further away, which is also further, further and back in time, to more close to the beginning of the universe. We can start to see the first galaxies forming. We can start to see the first stars forming in this era of time that's really only a few hundred thousand years after the Big Bang. We're not really sure what happened in a lot of that time. So sometimes we call it the dark ages. And um, because the JBOST looks at these really long wavelengths of light, we can see fainter objects at these huge distances. And we can start to make these observations about these really, really distant um, astronomical objects. Um, so the images in the little blue boxes on the left there represent some of the deep fields that we've taken over the years. And these deep fields, especially for Hubble, were really groundbreaking. They took days of Hubble observations to make these images. Hubble would point at a very tiny region on the sky where there didn't seem to be anything there, take an image, make an observation for days at a time, and the image is just flooded with galaxies. Um, and the longer a telescope exposes, the fainter the object you can see, and generally the further away you can look, the further back in time you can look. Um, so, so this is really the science that the JBOST was designed for. It's doing a lot of other things as well, as I'll show you, but JBOST was really optimized at long wavelengths of light to be away from Earth, to be very, very cool in order to see towards the very, very beginning of the universe. Um, a lot of people think that, okay, JWST is like a successor to Hubble, and we originally called it the Next Generation Space Telescope, um, but it's significantly different from Hubble in a lot of different ways. And so one of the ways is that the, the mirror is just a lot bigger and also optimized for infrared observations. So here's the telescopes kind of side by side. They're similar in size. They're both these behemoths, but the mirror for JWST is six and a half meters in diameter, whereas the Hubble Space Telescope mirror is only about two and a half meters in diameter. JWST has a segmented mirror, so it's made up of 18 individual gold-coated hexagonal segments. Um, and it's also, like I said, optimized for the near-infrared. In fact, it only looks at near and mid-infrared wavelengths, whereas Hubble had instruments that worked across the ultraviolet optical and near-infrared part of the electromagnetic spectrum. Um, Hubble was in orbit, low Earth orbit, so around the Earth, launched by a space shuttle, put into space by astronauts, serviced by astronauts several times. The solar panels were replaced, the instruments were replaced. JWST is actually a million miles away, well beyond the orbit of the moon around the Earth, and there's no plans for it to be serviced um, at all, just yet. Um, here is a sketch of JWST um, in orbit at this position that's called L2 or the second Lagrange point. It's like a gravitationally stable point. Um, it, what's interesting and useful about this point is that JBOST is in orbit beyond the Earth, but keeps up with the Earth. Normally based on Kepler's laws, JWST being further than the Earth would slow down and the Earth would kind of lap it eventually. But at this gravitationally stable point, JWST keeps up with the Earth. It's also well outside of the orbit of the moon. It's about a million miles away. And so that we, um, because it's, because JWST is always on the other side of the earth from the sun, which is the direction of midnight, essentially, we call JWST's position at L2 a million miles beyond midnight. And you can see in this little animation that that big kind of kite, the sun shield behind JWST is always kept facing towards the sun. So that blocks the, the sunlight from the instruments, from the telescope, from the mirror, and keeps everything nice and cool, helps keep everything nice and cool. There's also cooling systems on the telescope as well. Um, so that sun shield, I'll talk more about it. It's, it's amazing technology, and it's very, very necessary for JWST. And it's about the size of a tennis court out there in space. Um, JWST isn't the first telescope at this position in L2. There's uh, current telescopes and decommissioned telescopes that are actually already out there. So there's a little like space telescope party happening at L2. <laughs> um, but like Hubble, uh, JWST is an international mission and even more so. So Hubble was actually a collaboration between NASA and ESA, the European Space Agency, and JWST involves the Canadian Space Agency as well. And in fact, the entire observatory was designed, assembled, and tested around the world. Um, I started to try to make a, a little map of where the different pieces came from and where it went. 
and also almost make like a concert tour type t-shirt for it, but it got too complicated because things were all over the place. Um, but ultimately where JWST ended up, its last uh, party on earth was at French Guiana at the launch site that was provided by the European Space Agency. So the, the very bottom um, center point there. And this is JWST on a boat on its way to its launch site in, um, in French Guiana there. JVST, you might have heard about it before it launched. It was becoming infamous for its launch delays and its budget overruns. Um, and it was in precarious position for a little while. Um, but luckily it stayed funded um, and be became the butt of jokes a little bit. So this is a web comic called XKCD, which if you're a nerd, you know about it already. If you're not, welcome to the world of XKCD. Um, this was published in 2018 when kind of the last big delay for the space telescope was launched so, or was, was announced. And so in 2018, it was delayed until 2021. And what the comic did, his name is Man Randall Monroe. He has a column in the New York Times called What If and a couple books called What If. There, he's a wonderful kind of scientific thinker and um, comic artist. What he did was he plotted the points of the planned launch date versus the current date of when they were announced and then fit a line through that to try to guess when the space telescope would actually launch. And so the red line is the is the fit and the his guess was late 2016. And then I added in the yellow there because so in 2018, the delay was announced until 2021. It did eventually launch. That's the, the red point that I put here. But you can see there on the right that there was more and more delays and it was almost like Xeno's launch. Like the closer we got to the launch date, the smaller the delays got at least, but man, right up into the last second. So um, one of the things that I was chatting with people about was, especially when things got delayed, You know, maybe we thought maybe we'll have a Halloween launch, maybe we'll have a Thanksgiving launch. In November, when things got delayed until December 22nd, we were like, could this space telescope launch on Christmas? And friends of mine, two different friends of mine, I won't name names, but two different friends of mine who are in the know said, no, 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 no. Isa, the Ariana launch, the um, Ariana space, they don't work on Christmas. They won't launch the space telescope on Christmas. And then on December 15th, it was delayed until Christmas Eve. And then there were some weather issues. And so on December 21st, it was scheduled for Christmas. And we actually got a Christmas launch. And it, it is a Christmas that no astronomer will ever forget for a while. So here's a, um, one of my friends made this, the telescope who stole Christmas uh, graphic. Here's another um, uh, of my friend and her husband and her kid watching the launch. There's my kids watching the launch in, in front of the laptop. We all made our kids watch the launch before they could open their presents. Um, and then we made commemorative uh, Christmas ornaments for this as well. I, I even know a successful JWST TPI um, on, in the first cycle, which is a big deal for astronomers, had a baby on Christmas as well. So that was the kind of trifecta there. Um, she had to one up everybody, but that was really wonderful to find out. And it launched. Um, here is the final view of the space telescope leaving Earth. So there's no cameras on the telescope, except for the cameras that take pictures of space. Um, but there was there was cameras on the rocket and the rocket fairing. And so we did get this beautiful view of JWST leaving, leaving Earth. Um, but right now it's actually in this image, it doesn't look like that nice big triangular kite, di diamond shaped kite, um, because it's still wrapped up. So what I haven't told you yet is this telescope was actually so big that it did not fit in the biggest rocket that we had. And so the entire telescope was designed to fold up and be put into the rocket, packed into the rocket, and then unfold in space. And this was created a lot of tension for astronomers after the launch. It wasn't just the launch that we were nervous about, but the next um, several months actually after launch, especially the first 29 days. The first 29 days to get out to L2 was a big deal. And a lot of stuff had to happen during that time. So here's the telescope as it was folded up inside of the rocket fairing. And then this shows you what happens for the periods after launch as the telescope was deployed. So a couple hours that comes down um, after a few days. These are the pallets that the sun shield uh, that contain the sun shield. So the, the fore and the after they kind of name things like, like ship parts, which is really fun. The telescope kind of sits up a little bit. Um, the momentum flap or the aft flap 
deploys, and that's to um, alleviate some momentum as the telescope moves around or dissipate momentum as the telescope moves. And here the sun shield starts to come out. So first the booms on either side, and then these five layers of a, of a mylar-like material tension, unfurl and tension. And this was nerve wracking because these sun shield layers, it's very, very new technology. It caused a lot of the launch delays to be very, very careful about this. It's enormously important for the telescope to be able to cool and function optimally. Um, and it worked, it worked beautifully. Now the, the struts come down for the secondary mirror. And then finally the wings of the three segments on either side, oh, a radiator first off the back, and then the wings of the side panels of the space telescope fold out and lock into place. Um, uh, another friend who will not be named has told me that we've unfolded mirrors in space before, they look down and not up. Um, but the sun shield has never been done before. Those, those looking down telescopes didn't need the sun shield. And then 29 days after everything deployed, it, there was an orbital, there was a burn in order to put the position, the telescope into position in orbit around L2. Um, here's a, little, a diagram showing everything on a little bit of a timeline. So I showed you kind of the, the biggest things that happened for the space telescope, but actually counting everything up, there's over 300, what NASA called single points of failure where if something didn't go right, there was no redundancy. There was no recovery from any of those 344 things that could have gone wrong. As far as I know, none of them went wrong, which is just thank you, thank you, thank you to the 20,000 engineers, technicians, scientists who have worked on this space, te space telescope. Everything went beautifully. Um, in fact, everything went so well that originally they were planning on a five to 10 year mission for JWST. And really the limitation is the fuel for pointing the telescope. And so how much fuel it took to kind of course correct between Earth and L2 would determine the lifetime of the observatory. And after, I think it was just a few weeks after uh, the telescope got into L2, they announced that actually everything went so well, the, the launch, the deployment, the, the orbital burns were so good that JWST has enough fuel on board for a 20 year lifetime, which is just phenomenal to know that there's astronomers working now who can probably retire if, if astronomers retire, which we tend not to, um, still taking JWST data, which is just a wonderful, wonderful thing. Um, that still wasn't the end of astronomers nervously watching the deployment, because after JWST got to L2, the big commissioning starts happening. So this is like testing out everything, aligning everything, making sure everything on the instrument works. Um, and some friends of mine in the public affairs office uh, where the space telescope is headquartered said like, you know, we weren't kind of sure how interested people would be to watch these things, but they had a wonderful, like, where is JWST? How is it going? Timeline that you could check on the internet. Um, and we were checking it all the time. And so here's the mirror segments. Um, and then the secondary mirror is in the, in, in the center. That's what the SM stands for. And all the mirror segments have this letter and this number. They started out stowed at minus 12.5 millimeters and then they deployed to zero millimeters. And so that's where you wanted the, them to start out. Um, and so this was, you know, a 12 and a half millimeters is a, a little over a centimeter. Each of these segments of the mirror moved in space, but NASA made this wonderful um, uh, widget for watching them and we watched them and we cheered them on. There was a couple segments that happened more slowly um, and we were like, go, 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 go. It, watching paint dry in space, <laughs> these tiny, tiny motions. Um, but it was very, very fun to do. And I, I think NASA were even surprised and the Space Telescope Science Institute, people were surprised by how excited the general public was with every single piece of information they posted in every single blog post. So one of the first images that came out of JWST was this, this speckle here, the inset in the, um, in the white box. It's actually one star being observed by the 18 misaligned segments of the mirror. And so each segment produces its own image of the star. And you can see they're kind of all over the place. Some of them are different sizes, different shapes. 
and, and things like that. And so this is before the mirrors are uh, perfectly aligned to work as one. And then we also got a primary mirror selfie, which was super duper fun. So I said, there's no cameras on the telescope except for the cameras itself. And one of the, one of the internal cameras could take this, this selfie type thing, which one of the segments is very bright because that's the one that's catching the, the starlight at that time um, or the directing the starlight into the camera at that time. And so every one of these, you know, we were so thirsty for data and for news. We got very, very excited for every one of these, especially this one. So this is one of the first um, fully aligned images that they released. So uh, it's just, it's one star. So now all of the 18 segments are working together. Um, it's one star at the center and you'll begin to know and love this six pointed star with the extra um, horizontal line there, because this is really characteristic of JVST. It comes from the shape of the primary mirror. It comes from the struts on the secondary mirror and the detail in it and the crispness of it tell you how perfect the optics are. And this is also a single wavelength of light, a single filter. And so the, the colors actually are telling us brightness, not actually color information, but all around this single bright star, every single one of those specks is a distant galaxy. Something that Hubble used to take days to do, JWST is doing in its alignment. And so astronomers that I know, like this was just kind of, you know, released for fun, like, hey, look what we can do. And some astronomers that I know started to try to do science and, and analyze this image for those background galaxies. Um, but we were gonna get more. Um, and then they had, and that even is just from the alignment. So that's just from the calibration cameras. Then we had these four beautiful instruments that again, my colleagues have been spending decades of their careers working on. These each had to be commissioned. They had lots of different modes that they can operate in. Um, and people just worked overnight for, for months in order to commission these instruments. And all of them right now are working wonderfully. And so you can see the dates here. Um, when things were finished because everything is now finished. So basically in June and July of this year, each of these modes were finished. And then sometime in June, NASA announced that the first images would be released on July 12th. And in fact, they organized this, what's called a NASA social event. So these NASA social events are absolutely wonderful. They happen for a lot of NASA's big occasions. So for launches, for landings, for press releases and things like that, they, they announce ahead of time, hey, if you wanna come get a behind the scenes tour of NASA and you'll share it with your social media channels, you know, we'll welcome you behind the scenes. They're, they are usually open to um, only to US citizens and permanent residents, I have to say. Um, and you have to pay for your own travel, but once you're there, you are welcomed by the, the communications teams at NASA with open arms. And so I applied for one of these. Um, I think I might have applied back in May. And in June, I found out I had gotten accepted. And so I was very, very excited. It was, it was a little bit weird because it's open to the public. I was really the only professional astronomer on this on this NASA social event. All my other colleagues were working, <laughs> but I met um, amateur astronomers and aerospace engineers and artists and accessibility advocates and policy experts and all different types of people who were just interested in space and wanted to be a part of this day too for the release of the JWST first images. Um, and it ended up being absolutely wonderful. And a friend of mine made a, uh, a nice tumbler with the date on it to commemorate it like we did the, the Christmas ornaments. And so that was really, really fun. Um, and it was, I just, it, it was, it was an unbelievable experience. Um, I still have to blog about it and post about it a little bit more, but here's just a couple of images from the day. One is in the morning. So the, the, it's a sneak peek of the image as well, because the image was actually revealed the night before by the white house. And NASA is one thing, but when the White House wants to get involved in, in things, you know you've got something good. And so Na the, it was actually a surprise to apparently the NASA communications people as well. And so um, the president, the vice president, and some of the JWST scientists unveiled the very first image, the deep field that you see there on the screen the night before. And so that one was kind of already out of embargoed. Um, for our event. And so this is us, the, the top photo is us the morning of the event, uh, meeting with some of the NASA communications people. And then at the bottom is during the press release, we were in a big auditorium. There was, it was actually happening across many locations. And we were in an auditorium with um, Thomas Zerbuchen, who was the 
associate administrator of NASA. So one under Bill Nelson, who's the uh, administrator um, and the head of the science mission directorate. And so basically the lead scientist at NASA, along with John C. Mather, who is the senior project scientist for JWST, as well as a Nobel Prize winner, winner in physics. Um, and Bill Nelson was in the room and a, a lot of other Maryland-based politicians were in the room and all of the, the, the suits on the mission, basically. Um, and if you think that professional astronomers like don't fangirl about astronomy and, and NASA people like this, you're totally wrong. I was over the moon. It was super duper exciting. Um, and I also got to see some of my friends and congratulate them on, uh, on a job well done. And it had been really years and even decades in the making for a lot of people. Um, and now on to the images. Here's the first one that was released by the White House. Uh, this is JWST's first full color deep field. And again, those six pointed stars, anytime you see that six pointed star, you know it's gonna be a real JWST image now. And I love how that's becoming so recognizable. Um, but this image isn't just a deep field because it's actually a galaxy cluster at the center of it. So some of these big fuzzy things at the center are enormous galaxies that are close to one another in space, even closer than any of the galaxies near the Milky Way galaxy and much bigger than the Milky Way galaxy as well. And then you might notice that there's these kind of streaks around this cluster of galaxies and they're all kind of orange and elongated in these, these like circular patterns around it. And those are actually background galaxies that are distorted as the light from those galaxies passes through the curved space time around the galaxy cluster. And so these are called gravitational lensed, gravitationally lensed galaxies, and it's proof of Einstein's theory of general relativity. It's just there's so much amazing physics and astrophysics going on in this, gal in, in this image. It's just jaw dropping. Um, so they showed us this image. We had known about it from the night before. But then when I was in that room, this amazing thing happened. It was the first time that I've ever heard gasps elicited by a spectrum. And so they showed us this slide and the entire room, you could feel the breath come out of it. So what this is, is, this, is a one part of the image and then one particular galaxy that is from 13.1 billion light years away. And they took a spectrum of it and they've identified um, atoms in that spectrum that can help us figure out how far away this galaxy is. And so in this image, this particular galaxy, we're seeing it as it was just half a billion years after, uh, uh, yeah, half a billion years after the beginning of the universe. It's just amazing. And I love this visualization and the identification of oxygen and hydrogen and neon in the spectrum. These lines help us figure out exactly how far away the galaxy is and can help us figure out what it's made out of and, and things like that, that help us understand the very formation of galaxies at the very beginning of the universe. The next image that we got was another spectrum actually, and this is a spectrum of an exoplanet. So one of the first exoplanets observed by JWST. This is what's called a transmission spectrum. So it's a little bit weird because we're actually looking at starlight passing through the atmosphere of the planet or being blocked by the atmosphere of the planet. And, but through that, we can kind of back out a spectrum of the planet and figure out what molecules or what elements are in its atmosphere. And so in this spectrum, the model of the spectrum is fit, uh, is the blue line. And then each of the individual white dots is a data point. Um, and the fit is pretty good. It, the, the data get a little bit messy at either end and they don't actually fit the model. That tells us there's work to do. I also like to call that job security, um, but there's also, it shows us that there's a water vapor in this exoplanet, uh, in this exoplanet's atmosphere. So not the first time that we've ever seen water vapor, but a very nice detection. Then we get some more images. So this is a planetary nebula called the Southern Ring Nebula. It actually has nothing to do with planets. That's just a, a name left over from when these types of objects were first discovered. But this is a nebula surrounding a dying sun-like star. So at the end of a star's hydrogen fusion life, it's gonna eject its outer layers and then the core collapses, gets very, very hot. 
And that high energy radiation from this very hot star will illuminate the outer layers that it has shed. Um, it's a beautiful thing because it actually, it's, it's very temporary because this phase of stellar evolution doesn't last very long. Um, but there's a lot of stars like this. And so we can see a lot of these planetary nebulae around in space. And they're called planetary because they kind of look like planets through small, small telescopes because they can tend to be roundish and kind of bright and colored at the center there. Um, but not only did we look at it, so this is a near cam image, a near infrared camera. It was also observed at mid infrared wavelengths of light with the MIRI instrument. And in fact, MIRI reveals the second star at the center here. And so this is, shows that this is not just one star, but a binary star system at the center. Um, and one of the things we're still trying to figure out is that do you actually need a binary star to make planetary nebulae? We're not sure. Um, and another thing that you see in this image is still lots and lots of background galaxies. So many background galaxies in everything. Then we got some actual galaxies, still tons and tons of background galaxies, but these uh, main galaxies are called Stefan's Quintet because there's five galaxies. These galaxies have been known about for, for hundreds of years or so, um, but actually three, four of the galaxies. So one, two colliding here, and then a third one are all about the same distance. So these are all about a cluster of galaxies that are actually related to one another. And then this is a closer galaxy. So this is a foreground galaxy we now know. JWST can see individual stars in that foreground galaxy. And again, in the background, littered with background, distant background galaxies. And some of them, you can even make out spiral structures in them. It is just, it is stunning. And the stars, still have these six pointed um, uh, beautiful spikes around them. And if these galaxies look familiar, it might be because you've watched It's a Wonderful Life. These are actually the galaxies that are the angels in It's a Wonderful Life. And this is my favorite image. This is not, the, so the last one that we got uh, from the JWST first images released, I wanna show you this first because this is the Hubble image of it. Um, it's a region of the Carina Nebula which is a big nebula in the Southern hemisphere. Um, it's actually a, a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful nebula. It's kind of analogous to the Orion Nebula in that it's nearby. It's a star forming region. That's a lot of gas and dust where young massive stars are being formed. This region is kind of on the outskirts of, of that nebula. So this is the image that Hubble had produced um, several years ago already now. And then the JWST image is just, striking the the improvement in detail the the crispness the texture i encourage you to get this one um download the full resolution put it on a screen turn out the lights and just sit here and get lost it's so so beautiful i love the different colors of the stars the 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 texture of everything it's this this one is is one of my favorite images. If I had to pick a favorite, um, I cried. I teared up when this one was shown. I was just, I knew it was going to be good, but I had no idea it was going to be good, this good. It was just so, 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 so gorgeous. Um, so it's called the Cosmic Cliffs and the Carina Nebula. And some people online have written about how the composition of the image with the colors and with the orientation actually evokes landscape um, uh, paintings, which is a, a really wonderful thing to compare it to. It, it looks so real. It looks like we could reach out and touch it. Um, so these are all the images that we got in July, but JWST has not slowed down. And one of the wonderful things about the, this particular period in JWST's time is that all of the data as they're being taken are immediately being released. It's called the early release science period where every observation is put directly into the archive and is immediately accessible. And this is so that scientists can kind of make the most out of the, the instruments, figure out how to use the telescope and really get up to speed as quickly as possible. And this has worked out amazingly because there's some wonderful people who are not actually professional astronomers, but who are incredibly talented with um, image production and image processing. And they will even go into the archive and make their own versions of of images of the observations that NASA will then use. Um, and this image of Jupiter is one of those. So even that very first day when the images were released, there was also a commissioning document released, like a big PDF that was dumped somewhere on the NASA website. But within that PDF, 
there was a little figure that had some images of Jupiter and astronomers caught on to that and said, we want Jupiter. And so this is one of the next images that were, was released was of the, the kind of full observations of Jupiter using JWST. And we can see the Aurora and we can see the equatorial bands and we can see the great red spot. And it's just, it's absolutely beautiful. Um, and if we zoom out to the wider field, we can see the rings around Jupiter. All four of the gas giant planets have rings. We can see some of the moons. Um, the uh, One of the close bigger moons, Io, is actually off of the screen, but it's so bright that we can see diffraction spikes. So a, a, a spike from how bright that one is. Um, it's just the, the JWST is optimized for faint objects. And so the bright objects some, can sometimes be hard to deal with. Um, here's another one that people found in the archive. This is actually one star and you can see the diffraction spikes again. And we've actually moved, zoomed in pretty far so that those diffraction spikes separate into those kind of streams like that. You might also think that the kind of half concentric circles are image artifacts. Those are not, those are real. Those are from the star. So this is a very massive star that's becoming unstable towards the end of its very short lifetime. And over the past 150 years or so, it's been expelling gas and dust from its outer layers. And then its light is illuminating those layers as they extend out into space. And so that is all real, all of those circles. It's almost like tree rings around this star. It's called a wolf ray star. Um, this is released by uh, a science team. So it's not official NASA processing, but it's the Orion Nebula from a science team. And again, there's beautiful six pointed refraction spikes and this absolutely gorgeous nebulosity that we can see in the infrared around these, these stellar nurseries, essentially. Um, this one is a, is a real press release from NASA again, and this is one of my favorites. So this is a uh, image of an exoplanet, an image of an exoplanet, not a spectrum that we get from directly from looking at the star, but what's shown here is we've blocked out the light from the star. So the central star is actually obscured and labeled by the little um, white star here at the bottom. And then the light is, um, from the planet comes through when you block out the light from the star. So this is called coronagraphy and JWST can do this with some of its instruments. Um, and so we, we can also see this planet at different wavelengths of light that can tell us what the temperature of the planet is. It can start to tell us what the composition of the planet is. And we might be able to start to figure out how the planet formed around this particular star. It's just beautiful, beautiful data, even if it looks a little smudgy and things like that. Um, then even more recently, we got the Tarantula Nebula. This is a beautiful nebula in the Large Magellanic Cloud, one of these small satellite galaxies near the Milky Way. It's a nebula around um, a cluster of massive stars that are forming. And so the six pointed stars are probably nearby stars in the Milky Way galaxy. And then the rest of the stars are these distant stars in about 150 light years away in the Large Magellanic Cloud surrounded by this beautiful gas and dust that's illuminated and starting to be blown away by the massive stars. And, but it, so that image was in the near infrared and this is an image in the mid infrared. And so all of these images are kind of recolored into visible optical um, colors of light that we can see, but they're done so in kind of as high fidelity as possible and also very carefully to make beautiful images as much as possible as well. Um, the mid infrared camera is a little bit lower resolution. And so things look a, a little bit fuzzier. It's not quite as crisp of detail, um, but it's still absolutely stunning. This is another image. So of uh, this galaxy, this is Messier 74 or M74, also called the Phantom Galaxy. And this is one, another one that was released by the instrument or the science team and not directly from NASA, but I love this one. It's called the phantom galaxy because of these dark voids that we can see within the spiral arms. Um, and it's just such a huge relatively nearby galaxy that it fills up the entire frame of the observations as well. It's just, it's stunning. Um, this one kind of scared people a little bit too. When you think about every single speck of light in this image being an individual star or maybe even a cluster of stars. And if we, and if you start to think too much about the possibility of planets around all those stars in this other galaxy and the possibility of life 
on those planets around those stars um very quickly you want to kind of curl up into a ball and not think about it anymore <laughs> um in happier news this one's called the cartwheel galaxy so this is another one that was released by nasa um called the cartwheel galaxy it's kind of an unusual galaxy structure with these um rings inside and out and kind of spokes in between the two probably caused by a uh, recent collision or at least a near um uh near pass with another galaxy which can kind of stir things up in galaxies and trigger star formations so that's a beautiful one to look at in the near infrared even more recently, Hubble has, or um, JWST has actually looked at Mars. Mars is at the limits of what JWST can track. So Mars actually moves so quickly across the sky that um, JWST would have to move very quickly in order to keep it, keep observing it. But uh, Mars is actually the closest thing to Earth that JWST can see, I believe. And they did it within just a few months of commissioning. Last but not least, I want to show you the most recent images that have been released by uh, NASA from the JWST. You might have seen these in the news just the last couple of days. This is Neptune, um, as seen by JWST. We see beautiful rings around it. We see its bright bands of storms. The, the bright dots in this image are the moons. It's not nearly as crisp as the Voyager image that we're used to seeing, but that's because Voyager was a spacecraft that flew by. And this is still JWST looking at it from billions of miles away but still a wonderful, wonderful image. And if we zoom out a tiny little bit, we can see Neptune's large moon Triton is actually so bright that we get these diffraction spikes, these six points around the point of light because um, Triton is actually very big and very icy. So it's very, very reflective at near infrared wavelengths of light. Um, and these, so these two images were released by NASA but ESA released this image, which is also very beautiful. This is the full field from NearCam, the near infrared camera showing um, the Neptune system and its moon along with all of these other galaxies. Every field that JWST observes is going to be a deep field with all of these galaxies. It's just stunning. And the amount of data and the amount of science that we're gonna be able to do with these images is just amazing. Um, and it's it's barely been six months, um, really only a few months of active science observations with all four of these instruments. We've done pretty good so far. So here's the photographic plate that I promised you. On the left, it's in a negative. So the bright, the dark spots on the image are actually the bright things. So the stars and the nebulae, that whole nebula, um, the dark smudge is the Carina Nebula in the Southern Hemisphere. So this photographic plate was taken in 1896 um, from Peru at, at the Harvard College Observatory um, that was operating in Peru at the time. They were, they were surveying the entire sky from a Southern Hemisphere location and from a Northern Hemisphere location. And these photographic plates, these glass plates, it would actually be the basis for decades of astronomical observations and discoveries. And that tiny little red rectangular inset in there shows where the cosmic cliffs from JWST are and how far we have come in 128 years is just astounding. I think Paul Rudd would agree. And so the, I'm gonna, the image that I'm going to leave you with is a lot of these things that I've showed you put together into this wonderful 18 segment um, hexagon pattern compiled by Hannah Wakeford, who's a uh, an astronomer working in the UK. Um, and it's just the, the number of people that are going to contribute to and benefit from JWST is astounding. And I hope that includes everyone in the audience who can now recognize and, and understand and appreciate these JWST images. And so I'd love to take some of your questions. Hi, Emily. So there are tons of questions actually. Awesome. Yeah given through registration and also now here on, on the presentation. So with the first question, um, let me just move up. Angela wrote, who would you rename the JWST telescope after? Or what name would you give it? That's a really good question. Um, I'm going to defer to my colleagues who have done a lot more research about it. And in particular, um, Chanda Prescott Weinstein, who's a um, professor at the University of New Hampshire, um, and a wonderfully interdisciplinary. She's a um, astrophysicist as well as a feminist 
um, scholar, a gender studies scholar, and she has suggested the, um, she and, and some colleagues as well, some collaborators, collaborators have suggested um, the Harriet Tubman Space Telescope. And you might think, well, that's not, she's not an astronomer, um, but she is, you know, the um, Harriet Tubman and others who worked on the Underground Railroad. Uh, sorry, I'm gonna, I'm gonna um, use the stars to give people freedom and, you know, and risk their lives to do it. Ooh, sorry. Um, wh what a wonderful thing to honor. What a wonderful person to honor. Um, I'm sure that there's many, many others that we could think of. Um, but I think that's an especially poignant one right now. And so I would definitely support if we could rename it the Harriet Tubman Space Telescope. She is definitely an astronomer. Thanks, Emily. I'm just going to go to another question that came through the registration. Can you name some of the research that can be done by James Webb Space Telescope, which was unthinkable using images from Hubble? Oh, yeah. Um, a lot of these really distant galaxies. So both these galaxies and these exoplanets, it's fun because it's kind of both extremes. Um, the mid-infrared especially, we struggled a lot at. So Hubble didn't have any mid-infrared in, in instruments. Mid-infrared is very, very challenging to do with it from the ground. Um, and a lot of the times we have to break up the, the wavelength ranges and do them separately with separate telescopes and separate instruments. And it gets really hard to stitch everything together. The beautiful thing about JWST is that it can cover so much of this wavelength regime and all at once and in such a short period of time. Um, and so even a lot of my science, so, so there's people doing wonderful science on brown dwarfs, the astronomical objects that I study, that it's just the, the difference between what we chipped away for days at from the ground to get like a couple little data points are now this enormous wealth of data that's very, very high resolution, very, very high signal to noise, like just such high quality data. It's like going from like struggling to find drops of water to just being in a fire hose, like the 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 the, the um, fire hydrant is open. It's just astounding, and so really across a lot of these fields of research, JWST has cracked the whole thing open. It's it's amazing, and there's probably things that we haven't even discovered yet that JWST is going to help with as well. That's happened with previous space telescopes. Thanks, Emily. The next question from Max, do you think scientists who aren't allocated time on JWST can still make observations from the public data? Yes, there, absolutely. Yeah. Um, and his second point, is there an opportunity for civilians to as well? Yeah, absolutely. So all of the data are on the archive. Um, the place to look is called MAST or the Mikulski um, archive for space telescopes. Barb Mikulski is a senator from Maryland, and she was instrumental in um, keeping these projects funding, ad advocating for these projects in Congress. And so the archive is named after her. Um, it's not easy. It's a it's an archive of data, and so you do have to learn how to use it. But right now, all of the observations that are being made are going into that archive as soon as the data are downloaded. And there's um, there's commissioning documents, there are instructions for using them. You know, I, I wouldn't say that anybody off the street could do it, um, but anybody off the street can definitely learn how to do it. And the same thing with this with the other scientists. So there was a competitive um, proposals for a uh, competitive process for proposing to make observations with JWST. Not everybody was awarded those proposals the first time. Um, I didn't get any, but my collaborators got some. Um, and you can, but now the point is the the idea of the tele, of the data being immediately available is that we can get the data, um, kind of practice on it, analyze with it, figure out how to improve our um, proposals for the next round. And so basically, every year there's going to be new cycles of proposals and then new observations selected and planned and executed. And so, for a scientist, you know, for somebody. Um, just starting out today, like, you know, a, a, a kid in high school, a kid in middle school, who's like, maybe I'll be an astronomer someday. Hopefully JWST will be around when those students are, are starting to do real astronomical research. Um, and JWST will still be taking data for them as well. Thank you so much. Another question, I know there's so many, so I'm going <laughs> to try to see if we can get um, you to answer all of them but the next one is if the universe is expanding what is it expanding into oh that's a great question and a very very typical question that people have 
and this is it's it's admittedly challenging to wrap your your head around because we you know we think of expansion into something the amazing thing about the universe is that it's the universe itself expanding and what it's expanding into is beyond our beyond our reach um it, it could be some kind of higher order multiverse or something like that maybe we're next to another universe but by definition the universe is everything that we can see and experience and so that's kind of our limitation right now but it's the universe itself expanding it's the very fabric of space-time expanding um it, it's wild it's wild but it's it's proven time and time again by all of our observations and so it's real which is amazing too so going in i think just kind of piggybacking um another question came it's does the telescope offer new information about the existence of nature of multiverses oh i don't think it will i don't think jbst will address the multiverses the thing is that the multiverses are like necessarily out of our reach and if if we start to to make observations of another multiverse like then it becomes part of our universe um so the multiverse is still kind of the domain of, of philosophers and at least theory and in, in in physics right now um and not the this is really the observations the experiments in astrophysics are the things that we can actually see for now um maybe it'll maybe jwst will contribute to our understanding of dark energy which is something that's accelerating the expansion of the universe and so it's something that we think is has changed over the history of the universe we're still trying to figure out kind of how the universe formed how it got its structure how it's changed over time and jwst will definitely help with that but still within our own universe. Great, thank you so much. Next question is, can you talk about what led you to become an ast astronomer? Was it something you always wanted to do or was it a winding pathway? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and on paper, my pathway looks kind of not winding. Like I was always a nerd growing up. Um, it's, Hi mom, if, if my parents are here. Um, and I always liked math, I always liked science, I always liked school in general. Um, and. When I started college, I kind of wasn't sure what I wanted to do. I started out majoring in math because I thought like, that's the thing that I seem to be best at. I'll stick with that. I didn't like my math class that I, that my first math class that I took in college, but I happened to sign up for an astronomy class. Um, and I had read a couple books before that that were really enough recommended by my math teacher, um, books about space by Timothy Ferris. Um, and the, the astronomy class, blew me away um, and for any of the college students watching any especially our macaulay students the class was scheduled from 3 to 350 um but we never left at 350 the professor just kept talking <laughs> but we loved it so much that we stayed and we each of us would stay as long as we could and then we'd kind of sneak out and the next day we'd come back and, and say like how long did you stay how long would you stay we we loved it and so i switched my major from math to physics in order to take the rest of the astro classes um and I haven't gotten bored yet is, is basically what happened after uh, after college and I majored in physics and astronomy I did a little bit of research, but not a huge amount. I actually took some time off but I but I ended up getting a part time job at a planetarium in Baltimore where I was living at the time. Um, and the and working in the planetarium and learning more about the constellations and learning more about communicating to the public. I decided I really did want to go to grad school and do some research and kind of contribute to the news that I was reading about and 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 teaching to people in the planetarium. And so I went to graduate school. Um, I kind of wasn't sure what I would do after that, but I applied to postdocs because that was the next step. And I happened to get a postdoc um, down the street from Macaulay at the American Museum of Natural History, where I had never been before. And I set foot in there and I was like, my first stop was to HR to get hired. But I said, I love this place. This is amazing. I started to give planetarium shows. You know, I met Neil Tyson. I never wanted to leave. Um, and so luckily a uh, job opened up at CUNY at the College of Staten Island. I applied for that. I loved it. Everything that I read about CUNY, everything that I learned about the students. And then I started that job teaching astronomy, working with research students, getting grants. Um, starting my own research group, everything I was like, wow, this is awesome. It wasn't anything that I even knew that I could do when I was younger. Um, but I just kind of put, kept putting one foot in front of the other and, and taking the next step and taking the next step. Um, and it's gotten me here to Macaulay and to tenure. And it's been absolutely amazing. And one of the favorite, my favorite things about my job now is helping other people do the same 
but without my mistakes <laughs> and without my uncertainty and kind of not knowing what I was getting myself into. Um, and so hopefully that's a, a, a fun thing to think about. Thank you so much. I know that we're kind of running out of time and I, I can listen to this and view those slides over and over. I just have one other question that I want to get to from Danielle, who's a student. And oh, she wonderful. Says, so, can you please recommend books, online classics, etc., that someone who doesn't have a background in astronomy could start to learn from? I've always been interested, but didn't have a chance to take any classes in college, and I don't know where to start. Oh my goodness, there is so much. Yes. Um, uh, the, the amazing thing is that there's no wrong answer to this. There, the, it's everywhere. There's one of the wonderful things about astrophysics, especially, is because so much of it is publicly funded. NASA is publicly funded. The NSF is, is publicly funded, taxpayer money. So much of it is also publicly available. Um, and so it really it depends on what you want to do and how you want to learn best. There's books, kind of traditional. Um, popular science books written by people like Neil deGrasse Tyson, um, even Stephen Hawking's books. Timothy Ferris is the author that I found. He wrote a book called Coming of Age in the Milky Way and then The Whole Shebang. And it was one of those that I read. I read them both eventually. Um, and one of those really got me hooked on astronomy when I was in high school. Um, Brian Greene's Intelli the, Intelligent the Elegant Universe. Um, but now there's so many books by amazing people. Um, Katie Mack is a uh, um, a uh, professor who has a book called um, The End of Everything, which is about the end of the universe and our kind of understanding of how that will happen. Chana Prescott Weinstein has a book um, that's about the universe and also how we understand it. Um, it's called The, the Disordered Cosmos, I believe. Um, uh, uh, another uh, friend of mine I know called um, uh, named Neil Deacon has a book that's called 20 Worlds that's about exoplanets. Um, I'm blanking. Oh my God. There's another book by Emily Levesque, who's a professor at University of Washington called The Last Stargazers. That's about um, uh, 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 kind of ground-based astronomical observations with, with telescopes and how those are changing from um, the, into the modern times. So there's traditional books. There's also a ton, a ton of YouTube channels. There's science communicators. Um, uh, uh, th there's, there's people on Instagram who do wonderful things. There's PBS Digital Studios and, and people like Hank Green and SciShow. Um, there's Neil Tyson and television shows. There's documentaries. There's his whole Star Talk podcast. Um, oh my, there's so many ways. And so it's kind of pick your favorites. Make sure that you're getting good information, kind of legitimate information. And so do check the, the kind of qualifications of your source. Um, cause you know, some of the things, especially on YouTube and things like that can get a little bit dicey. Um, but there's so many wonderful people out there that are, that are creating content and sharing the cosmos with people that there's, there's a ton of places to start. Maybe I can work with Charmaine and, and get something, um, a little bit more written down to share with you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Emily. I just want to, um, leave off that, um, you had a, Someone wrote, Professor Rice, I'm so moved by your description of why Harriet Tubman is the perfect choice. As soon as you said her name, I knew it was because of the use of the stars and the rivers on to the journey of freedom. So you have Thank uplifted you. Yeah. Um, her and of the result of this talk. So it's, thank you so much for joining us and giving your, your expert eyes and your knowledge on this topic. I think everyone is just so excited about what they're seeing. Um, we look up to the sky every day and at night and see the stars and you just given us um, more information of you know what we're looking at. And is you just represent in terms of the faculty here at Macaulay and CUNY, you represent the best and we're so thankful to have you here and to the parents and to the students and to any members um, the community of Macaulay. Um, this is where our students are studying. They have professors like Emily Rice in their corner and we are so appreciative of um, all of our faculty members and you know supporting Macaulay. This is what it's all about. Our um, faculty is here teaching them um, what they know and, and more. Um, this is for a transformational, um, to really transform our student lives. So we really thank you for supporting us and tuning in to this event. And we hope to see you at another event. And if you would like to 
um, continue to support Macaulay, um, please visit our support page. Thank you everyone for joining us tonight.